Yeah, good evening, guys. So please type in the chat box. Is the audio and video fine? Good evening, all of you. So please type all clear, right? Okay. Uh, so good evening. Was not able to do yesterday's class. Can I continue today? Yeah, because I'm going to start air conditioning today. So it's a, a new topic. So basically, you can uh, continue. Okay. So this is lecture number nine. And in this lecture, of course, it's titled steam and gas turbines, but majorly we will be covering first psychometry, so properties of moist air, then psychometric chart, we'll have a look at psychometric chart and also we'll look at psychometric properties actually, okay? And then if time permits, I'll also have some, some bit of compasses. I'm not sure whether I can come till this point, but uh, maybe this com complete air conditioning, I'll try to cover in a detailed effective way actually, okay? So this is the case. So anyway, if you go to the last lecture, in last lecture we were talking about efficient systems, correct? So we were talking about refrigeration systems. So we talked in detail about vapor refrigeration systems, vapor refrigeration systems. We started talking about this vapor refrigeration systems. In this, we have seen basically two types. One is vapor compression refrigeration system and vapor absorption refrigeration system, actually. Okay, so VCRS and also VARS. And basically, the main difference in the phenomena is in one case, we'll directly by taking the help of a compressor, we will directly compress the uh, vapor. But right now, in this case of VARS, the compression or basically taking from low pressure to high pressure is because of chemical absorption. Okay, so there are two different techniques for increasing the pressure from low pressure to high pressure, actually. So this, depending on the two techniques, we have studied this VCRS and also VARS. And also we have seen a bit of gas refrigeration systems. Good evening, all of you. Gas refrigeration systems. Okay, so in gas refrigeration systems, again, we have seen how to identify the COP. If ever said a baton cycle, if bell coiling cycle is given to you, then basically you'll calculate the thermal efficiency and you'll calculate the COP. Or you can apply the formulas directly. And for calculating temperatures, we'll use this adiabatic relations. Okay. And in gas, after gas refrigeration systems, we have also seen nomenclature, nomenclature of efficients. We have also seen nomenclature of efficients. Okay, and after that, uh, we have also talked about Joule-Thomson coefficient. One very important factor, which is Joule-Thomson coefficient. Joule-Thomson coefficient. Okay, so Joule-Thomson coefficient actually. Okay, and normally in case of vapor compression systems and all, with the same setup, we cannot use gas as the working fluid because if you take ideal gas, the ideal gas have mu z is equal to zero and it do not cool during throttling. Okay, so anyway, these are the things that we have uh, discussed in brief yesterday. Of course, we have put majority of our time in this understanding vapor compression refrigeration systems because you see 98% of the gate questions are on this VCRS, of course. Okay, now anyway, so today this is the sequence actually. Maybe I think. I can touch this, but if time permits, we will go there. Otherwise, I'll uh, try to apply the notes for compressors and this uh, turbines. And tomorrow and day after tomorrow, we'll spend qualitatively on compressible flows, which is a very important topic again. Okay, clear? And the calculations and all in compressors are similar to the IC engines, basically, in the case of indicated power and all. But anyway, we have already talked about these compressors and turbines good enough in Rankine, uh, compressors in Baton cycle and steam and gas turbines in Rankine and baton cycles but some uh, physical aspects of these turbines i'll try to produce some notes if i cannot uh, cover that okay because there's only one question till now in compasses in recent times at least last you know uh, some seven eight years so we will see whether we can touch this or not i'll try to touch that okay and two days we'll spend qualitatively on compassable flows understanding compassable flows okay because every year definitely one question is coming from one or two questions is coming from compassable flows okay so that's how we're gonna move now let's see properties of moist air good basic properties okay now if you see normally dry air if you take atmospheric air it has a composition of 78% roughly of nitrogen and 21% of oxygen by volumes of course and 1% roughly of some inert gas mixtures some inert gases basically helium neon all this stuff okay so we have some traces of those gases actually and we know if you want to calculate the molecular weight this molecular weight of dry air Normally, if you adjust this as 0.5, 1% as 0.5 and 0.5 in this, 0.785 into molecular weight, you might have studied this, molecular weight of, you know, uh, nitrogen. Nitrogen is 28 plus 0.215 times of molecular weight of oxygen is 32. So if you simplify this uh, roughly, you will end up with 0.71, no, 785 
into 28 plus 0.215 into 32. Okay, so if you simplify 28.86 hopefully. 28.9 some books you see. 28.86 gram per mole or kg per kilo mole is also fine. So kg per kilo mole is the molecular weight of the mixture of air normally. Why I am dieting this? Because we will use this in our calculations of wet moist air. Okay. Now if you see moist air, moist air, if you see this moist air, moist air is actually a combination of dye air plus water vapor. You can say vapor, dye air plus water vapor. So we all know like in our atmosphere when you have this uh, normally atmospheric air there is some amount of water vapor which is present and this water vapor is present actually in superheated state okay you can actually see the presence of water let's say for example if i bring a cool bottle okay let's say for example if this is a very cool bottle if i i mean filled with the water inside and let's say if i keep this bottle in atmosphere after some time you'll see there is small formation of dew par dew particles around this bottle as or no so the excess water which is coming on the top of the bottle is basically coming from the atmosphere okay now let's see in this dye this has the composition and this is vapor now the main question comes here is how much amount of vapor is actually present in the moist air that's what and it depends from locality to locality and also uh, other, uh, other certain parameters like specific humidity i mean sorry relative humidity and all we will see in detail but main question is how do you quantify this moist air okay so for quantifying we have one very important thing which is specific or you can say specific or absolute humidity absolute humidity specific or absolute humidity actually here so how do we talk about this specific or absolute humidity which is normally denoted as omega and the units are normally given as grams of vapor or you can write kg of vapor per kg of dye air kg of vapor per kg of dye air okay why we are writing kg of dye air why instead of writing total moist air look i'll tell you normally if you take a moist air mixture let's say this is moist air mixture now let's say this mixture has one kg of dye air all these are dye air particles okay so all these are dye air particles this is moist dye air this mixture is moist air actually moist air and within this dye air there is also some mixing of water vapor okay wait of course in less quantity in general so this is water vapor okay so this is vapor now practically if you see for one kg of air what you take the amount of water vapor which is present will be only few grams actually okay which we will also see from the cal help of calculations that this amount of vapor present in this mixture will be very very small so let's say if you have one kg of dye air and if you have x grams or x by thousand kgs of vapor then when you sum up this quantity will not contribute much okay it will be like 0 0.004 of that order normally 7 to 8 grams 15 grams 16 grams of that level so summation of these two can be almost equal to again 1 kg okay so mass total m total is equal to mass of air dye a plus mass of vapor now clearly since this quantity since m a is very very greater than this mv this implies your m total is almost equal to m a actually here okay so that's why whenever we define any quantities like specific enthalpy specific humidity whenever we are talking this we define with respect to kg of dye air actually it should be like kg of moist air okay but this moist air weight which uh, mass is almost equal to mass of dye air so that's why we denote all properties for kg of dye air actually is this clear to all of you so please type in the chat box is this clear to each and every one of you can you all understand why all units in case of specific humidity, specific enthalpy, all these points are mentioned with respect to kg of dye air, but not kg of moist air, because actually it's a mixture of both, okay? But practically, this is what happens, and we define all properties with respect to kg of dye air, okay? Now, as I told you, look, before going for some details of specific humidity, I want to teach you something. You all know, we have studied in, uh, you know, Rankine cycle also, our basic thermodynamics also might have seen properties of pure substances. Let's say if this is Ts, okay, so this is the graph. Now let's see if you have constant pressure, for example, say one atmosphere, okay. So this is one atmosphere. This is 
one atmosphere so one atmosphere pressure let's say this is one atmosphere at one atmosphere we all know this saturation condition or the boiling point is actually at 100 degrees celsius you know this okay so this is 100 degrees celsius of flame now we know if you can impact this pressure the boiling point of the water or the uh, liquid state can actually change okay so if i keep on decreasing the pressure this condensation or this phase change happens at a pressure which is very low actually in actual case normally atmospheric conditions are around 25 degrees celsius but within this 25 degrees celsius whatever is the water that is present that is already getting converted to vapor that means try to understand if you have something like this so let's say this is the case and let's say for example this is some 12 degrees celsius 12.5 degrees celsius or maybe let's say some 25 degrees celsius things like this at this condition if water is present in vapor form at this condition water is present in vapor correct water is present in vapor state water is present in vapor state that means can i say if this is lying somewhere here at 25 degrees celsius let's say if this is the line of 25 degrees celsius and let's say for example it's somewhere here then you can understand this pressure curve which is passing so pressure exerted by water vapor pressure exerted exerted by water vapor means the pressure at which this water vapor exists actually pv if i call this this will be much less than one atmosphere and normally at a range of 25 degrees celsius this is almost 3.15 kilopascals of such or 12.5 sorry this is 12.5 kilopascals roughly this is 12.5 kilopascals and sometimes when you go to 20 and all it's much low 3.16 4.28 of course this saturation values will be given you need not mug up but normally you can understand i think this is also 3.15 i'm sorry 3.15 kilopascals is what you have roughly okay so this water vapor is present at this particular pressure because at this temperature of 25 degrees celsius this is already in vapor phase okay now whenever you take this quantity pr which is reduced pressure reduced pressure this is pv divided by p critical and normally for water this critical pressure the isotherm or the constant pressure line this p critical is around 22.06 megapascals which is roughly 22060 kilopascals now if you calculate this reduced pressure value at this operating conditions pr is equal to pv is roughly 3.15 kilopascals by 22060 kilopascals and this value will actually tend to zero as or no correct so whenever this value reduced pressure is very small we have studied at very low pressures real gas start behaving as or vapors start behaving as ideal gas that's why since practically because of this water vapor present in air is at very low pressure so at such low pressures the critical pressure is too very high and this reduced pressure value will tend to zero and we know at low pressures at low pressures vapors or maybe real gases at low reduced pressures we can say better at low at low reduced pressures vapors real gases real gases behave as behave as ideal gas actually okay so they behave as ideal gas is this clear did you all understand why we can actually use ideal gas equations for the vapor present in the air practically we cannot use vapor i mean ideal gas equations here okay but because of this understanding you can see we can actually use treat this vapor as ideal gas and we can apply the ideal gas equations is it clear to all of you yeah good evening so every one of you suman nitin sukuma yogesh mohit loha vivek aspirant pritam every one of you so please type in the chat box is this clear to all of you can you did you all understand why we can treat vapor as ideal gas okay now let us see if you can treat vapor as ideal gas then let us come back here this omega is nothing but mass of vapor present for mass of air okay mass of di actually it's mass of total again because of same analysis this mass of total can be replaced with mass of air now 
in your basic thermodynamics in mixtures you might have studied dalton's law of partial pressure correct what is dalton's law of partial pressure let's see dalton's law dalton's law of partial pressures law of partial pressures actually dalton's law of partial pressures so what is this dalton's law of partial pressures look in a mixture let's say you have got certain mixture okay so in this mixture let's say you have some other component maybe second component you can have any number of gases doesn't matter now this tells you pressure total is equal to summation of pressures due to all the components correct let's say for example if i connect the pressure gauge here and let's say i got absolute pressure is equal to some i mean gauge pressure gives you gauge uh, reading but actually if you convert it into absolute let's say if this complete mixture is at absolute pressure of 150 kilopascals okay this 150 is summation of all the components correct from here if you want to calculate individual component you can see this is nothing but mole fraction times p total correct you might have seen this because if you maintain this ith gas only at the complete volume and at the same temperature conditions then definitely this pi partial pressure due to the ith gas can be taken as mole fraction of that particular component into the total pressure you all know this basically if you see p total v of the mixture is equal to total number of moles of the mixture into universal gas constant into temperature of the mixture now this dalton's law tells you if you keep only a particular gas let's say pi at the same conditions as that of the mixture at same conditions of vmix and tmix then clearly you can see this gets cancelled and pi is equal to n i by n total gives you mole fraction times p total actually so this is the dalton's law of partial pressure do you all know this yes or no in basic thermodynamics you might have seen in the first chapter maybe where we are talking about mixtures okay now let us see if this is pi now why i am talking this see here this omega is equal to mass of vapor by mass of dye air okay and we are treating both air and also vapor as ideal gases if you apply ideal gas equation for air for dry air for dry air we know pa v is equal to n a or m we will write in terms of characteristic gas constants m a r a into t of the mixture because complete air will be at one particular temperature and complete uh, air will be at one particular pressure similarly for vapor for vapor if you write p v into v is equal to mass of vapor characteristic gas constant of vapor into t actually you cannot do this but because of your ideal gas assumption you can do this if you divide these two let's see what you will get or this is 1 and this is 2 and if you divide 2 by 1 let's see what you will get actually first of all this T and V gets cancelled we have PV by PA will be equal to MV by MA into RV by RA correct this is what you will get yes or no now let us understand something here this implies mass of vapor by mass of air which is actually omega which you need omega is equal to pv by pa as usual pv by pa into this ra by rv ra by rv actually so this is pv by pa into this characteristic gas constant of atmospheric air can be written as universal gas constant divided by molecular weight of air divided by this characteristic gas constant of vapor can be written as universal gas constant divided by molecular weight of vapor and if you cancel these two then you can see omega is equal to omega is equal to molecular weight of vapor by molecular weight of air molecular weight of vapor by molecular weight of air into pv by pa actually okay now how you have this similarly if moist air is mixture of dry air and also water vapor using this equation can i write p total of the air means atmospheric pressure whatever you have is due to air plus due to vapor correct so therefore this pa can be written as p total minus pv pv by p total minus pv actually okay so simple gas loss i'm not, not using anything bigger now what about these quantities molecular weight of vapor so what I might be the phase this is always 18 h2o 18 and molecular weight of air we have just calculated what is that 
molecular weight of air we have calculated 28.86 roughly okay of course 28.9 whatever the values you can say 28.86 if you do this division 18 divided by 28.86 you'll get 0 0.622 is what generally taken because this is taken 29 rounded off to one decimal place so if you do 18 by 29 you'll get 0 0.621 uh, is coming okay somewhere in between because we have adjusted this one percent uh, here and there so this is normally the ratio which is equal to 0 0.622 actually okay 0 0.622 pv by p total minus pv and this p total is the normal atmospheric pressure at any point because of this is this clear to all of you did you all understand how this equation is com coming out so therefore your omega which is mass of vapor by mass of air is equal to 0 0.622 times vapor pressure by pressure of air which is total atmospheric pressure minus vapor pressure if pv is given you can actually calculate this quantity and this quantity signifies how much humidity is there if omega is very large then definitely you know it's a high humidity here normally your clothes and all won't get dried very soon okay so this is the equation which you might be seeing in our day-to-day -day life because of this dalton's law of partial pressure and this simple ratio to get this constant 0 0.622 you are applying ideal gas equation for vapor which is you know which gives you a, a very ac accurate result because of this pr tending to zero clear so please type in the chat box is this clear to all of you okay that's how we calculate omega we'll identify how much amount of vapor is present in a given amount of air okay so please type in the chat box is this clear okay yes now each and everyone if you have any doubts at any point please ask me because we'll go a bit quick today if, uh, okay now so let's see then we'll look at something called relative humidity relative humidity which is taken as actually okay now to understand this concept of relative humidity we need to understand certain things which is saturated air air and unsaturated air unsaturated air what are these two things that's the main thing which is important here to understand this uh, difference between saturated and also unsaturated look Normally, if you have a mixture of air, definitely it has some amount of air particles. You have some amount of air particles, and also you have some amount of vapor particles. You have some amount of vapor particles. Okay. Now, at a given temperature T, let's say if dry bulb temperature is T degree Celsius, we'll see what is dry bulb, wet bulb, and all. Let us say if the room temperature is T degree Celsius. At a given temperature, this air which is having have certain limit for carrying this water molecules. Okay, you cannot put one kg air and one kg water together. Okay, so definitely this air atmospheric, air, this dry air which is here has ability to carry certain amount of water. Now, when this is saturated, if you try to add any further water molecule at any other point, let's say if you try to further add at any water molecule, definitely from some other location water molecule starts condensing down okay so this is the point saturated air is at that particular point where you cannot add any excess amount of water to the air actually okay if you start adding water to the air at that point definitely at some other point condensation starts happening clear to all of you so this is saturated air and at this particular conditions whatever is the vapor pressure because at saturated condition also this air p total is equal to p a plus PV as PV actually okay but this PV at this condition of saturation is denoted with PVS actually okay where PVS denotes vapor pressure of saturated air vapor pressure of saturated air actually okay now normally you can uh, okay so this is vapor pressure of saturated air whereas unsaturated you can still keep adding some water because it can still take some water at this t degree celsius what happens if this is dye air if this is your dye air at this point like this 
and if you have this water molecules all over if you add this water molecule nothing no condensation happens here okay like this so clearly at this saturated condition the pressure exerted by the water vapor is called the saturated vapor pressure which is denoted with pvs actually okay so phi is actually the measure of what is the actual present by what is the maximum it can have that's the equation actually okay so phi always denotes you what is the water vapor that's actually present divided by what is the maximum it can hold at that point now if you take dry air for dry air okay for saturated air let us say better for saturated air mv actual that is present by mv maximum the air can hold at this point for saturated air from this understanding can you tell me what is the value of phi any one of you so for saturated air can anyone tell me what is the value of phi for saturated air what is the value of phi what is the value of phi it is 1 correct because and when this is saturated condition the mass of water vapor which is present will be already at the maximum at the maximum possible values okay so therefore this phi is equal to 1 now if you again apply ideal gas you will end up with this phi is equal to pv by pv at maximum location at maximum location pv is nothing but pvs so this is pvs pvs is nothing but saturation pressure at t degree celsius at whatever the uh, thing they might have given you so at a temperature let's say for example what is the saturation state normally this is the saturation state okay so air will be at this point if you try to add any further if you try to add small amount of heat or if you if you try to add any small amount of water condensation happens at some other location okay so this is for omega and this is for phi actually here and normally in general in general you can see this 0 less than phi less than or equal to 1 actually okay so 0 uh, phi lies always in between one, 0 and 1 normally if you take dry air where in places like Rajasthan and all if you see phi value will be very very less okay that's why normally if you walk in tar desert and all what happens even if your body sweats immediately sweat gets evaporated okay nothing like you uh, your clothes getting wet and all but actually if you stay in places like hilly areas and all you can easily see that this phi values are very large because basically whenever there is a water body like in case of beaches and all you can see if there is a beach and if there is uh, some sea like this then whatever is the air that's flowing on the top actually okay so this is air which is flowing on the top whenever this air is flowing for example if this is not unsaturated then it has plenty of amount of water to capture to evaporate some amount of water actually here yes or no so that's how this air actually gets cooled a bit and also this air is also at saturated conditions clear normally to understand this phenomena i'll explain you one thing there's one important phenomena which is called evaporative cooling evaporative cooling what is this evaporative cooling let us see first what is this evaporative cooling normally in olden days you might have seen if you have a pot like this okay okay i think there is no such pot like this but let's say for example if there is a pot like this okay assume this is a pot assume okay assume it is a pot now normally you might have seen normally there is water inside water inside and to make this water cool to cool this water what you do you pour some water on the surfaces have you ever seen this normally in olden days if you have this pot and if you tie a cloth around it what you'll do to cool the water inside the pot many of you might have seen these people start wetting the cloth actually which is uh, you know wrapped around the pot have you ever seen this come on have you ever seen this yes or no have you ever seen this yeah you have wet clothes or if what is not getting cooled down you actually wet the cloth to uh, you know higher extent actually okay the reason is normally this water vapor which is or this water let's say for example if i talk about this water molecule this water molecule gets evaporated into the atmosphere okay if a is unsaturated clearly 
if air is unsaturated then clearly what happens this water molecule this air which is present here try to understand at this state whatever is the air present this air will try to take this water molecule into it okay now for this water molecule to get evaporated it needs some energy correct so for this water molecule to get evaporated this molecule needs some energy the energy available for or the energy needed for evaporation of this molecule for of this water molecule is taken from two sources one is the heat from the air okay let's say if air is at some temperature then definitely this water molecule takes some temperature from this air and get some energy some remaining part of energy it will take from this water actually okay normally if you see in olden days if you are buying some pot for your home okay uh, still done in our homes are good okay so if you see when you are buying this pot people knock it and check the sound have you ever seen this have you ever seen normally they'll take the pot then they'll knock it and check the sound and depending on the sound they'll decide whether it's a good pot or not a good pot correct what they are actually doing when they are hitting is basically this pot which is here if this pot has to work effectively this pot should have many pores okay you know pores right pores is actually pores are small holes normally in case of molding sand and all you might have studied small holes very small holes they have fine pores now practically as soon as this water molecule gets evaporated then new molecule starts flowing from inner surface to the outer surface and some new particle gets landed here you might have seen normally if you fill the pot to some level okay let's say for example you filled the pot completely and if you don't touch the pot for four or five days after taking from after taking the lid for after four or five days you will see definitely water level in the pot might have reduced a bit have you ever observed this did anyone of you notice this if you see carefully if you fill the pot completely and if you leave it aside for four to five days after four to five days if you open the lid you will definitely find water won't be to the full it will be slightly less than the full level did anyone of you notice this anytime maybe sometimes you might have gone to your home uh, you know some uh, other places and all maybe for vacation and if you come back by the time you come back your pot won't have the full level okay so the reason for this is in a month it's gone <laughs> yeah correct okay so if you see this water molecule as soon as it gets evaporated new particles i mean new water molecules starts seeping through the pores and they land on the surface now how the water is cooling is for the evaporation of this molecule some part of energy is taken from this air and some part of energy is taken from this water and that's how whenever you are pouring water ex excessively you are sprinkling water neededly for the evaporation of this water molecules some part of energy is contributed by this water and if energy of this water is going out internal energy falls and temperature decreases that's how you get the cooling effect clear to all of you did you all understand this because of this evaporation if this water droplets are not there then definitely this water won't get cooled that's why if this water is not getting cooled people sprinkle water because these water molecules gets evaporated then again energy gets transferred and this water gets cooled clear that's how okay now this phenomena is very much important in deciding something called wet bulb temperature we will see what is that later okay but anyway why i'm telling you this here is because uh this is evaporative cooling for this phi okay so that's how evaporation takes place actually and normally in beaches and all you'll see some cool breezes flowing all over okay anyway this is for phi next important point is specific enthalpy of moist air this is a bit important specific enthalpy of moist air specific enthalpy of moist air so let's say there is some amount of air for example this is moist air moist air in which you have some amount of dry air you have some amount of dry air you have some amount of dry air and also you got some water vapor molecules maybe something like this okay you got this molecules now how to calculate the uh, enthalpy of the specific enthalpy of this moist air you all might have studied one formula h is equal to 1.005t plus omega times of by this time you know what is omega already 2500.9 or maybe some people study this as 2501 doesn't matter plus 1.82t correct have you all seen this formula have you all seen this formula right 
Type in the chat box. Have you all seen this formula? Yes or no? Come on, quick. Have you all seen this formula or not? Yes? Now, out of all of you who have seen this formula, how many of you don't know what is this? But I mean, you know that it is for specific enthalpy, but how many of you don't know why this came and what is what in this formula? Come on, tell me. I know definitely there will be few people who will try to just remember this formula and apply blindly because you know they want marks actually that's it how many of you don't know what is what in this particular formula i mean this term y2501 y omega y 1.82 what is that 1.82 what is this of course 1.005t this is a bit uh, clear but definitely there could be few people who might not understand what is what in this formula okay so let's see how we can actually get this formula now total enthalpy is equal to enthalpy of di a plus enthalpy of vapor correct now we have total some mixture then total you have not seen <laughs> good okay fine it's okay you will see now how this is coming so if you have a substance then the total enthalpy of the substance is equal to some of the enthalpies of its components correct like this ha which is enthalpy of di a plus enthalpy of vapor can i write this as m total into h is equal to this enthalpy of the air can I write as m a mass of air di a into enthalpy of di a plus mass of vapor into enthalpy of vapor okay so can I write this now if I write this if I divide with m total m total now clearly you know this m total is of course equal to almost equal to mass of di a in this h is equal to mass of di a and these two are equal so definitely this gets cancelled out we have enthalpy of di a plus mass of vapor by total mass which is mass of vapor by mass of air so we have omega times h v actually okay so this omega is came okay so this omega is this one thing is clear now let's see specific enthalpy of di a now dry air if you see di a this quantity is actually ideal gas ideal gas correct so di air is ideal gas vapor is also ideal gas we'll see but di air is actually ideal gas if di air is ideal gas h is equal to cp into t is what you have okay so cp into t is what i can write because dh is equal to cpdt h is equal to cpt which you all know now cp value is within the range of for minus 10 degrees to 50 degrees celsius means normally extreme conditions in deserts and also very low temperatures in some colder regions this cp value can be approximated as 1.005 kilojoule per kg kelvin or kilojoule per kg degree celsius anything is fine okay because for one unit temperature difference one unit temperature difference is same in degrees or kelvin whatever so 1.005 kilojoule per kg celsius okay now this t can be written in degree celsius in this formula you can directly put t in degree celsius okay t in degree celsius therefore h a is equal to 1.005 times t degree celsius actually okay so this is the first term clear so this part with 1.005 t corresponds to the di air properties now coming to water vapor let us see what you have water vapor coming to this water vapor this is again ideal gas ideal gas dh or h is equal to cp into t roughly so if you write h is approximately cp into t of course or specific heat into temperature c into specific heat okay so of course for ideal gas we have cp and cv but practically we'll take some average value of this okay so let's say this is cp for example cp into temperature now try to understand if i take this dome water dome ts now in this region you are treating vapor as ideal gas and in case of vapor your enthalpy is directly proportional to temperature and this is some constant cp that means if i want to plot lines of constant enthalpy how can i plot can i say there will be something like this yes or no because if temperature is constant enthalpy is also constant 
correct? Because Cp is in how constant will take. So T is constant implies H is also constant. That means lines of constant enthalpy will be parallel to the lines of constant temperature and lines of constant temperature will be horizontal lines. Okay. Now let's see if I have two, which means if I have one here, state one, for example, and if this is temperature one, T one, then definitely since this is a horizontal line, the enthalpy at this point and enthalpy at this point will be same, correct? So I can write H1 is equal to Hz corresponding to T1 degrees Celsius. Similarly, if I take any point here, for example, say this is point 2, this enthalpy will be same as this enthalpy of Lee and H2 is equal to Hz at T2 degrees Celsius. That's what we have. Okay. Now, let us uh, see something here. So this is Ha. If you want H2 minus H1, for example, this difference is Hz at T2 degree Celsius minus Hz at T1 degree Celsius. That's how you're going to calculate this. Okay. And also, let's say if I have only one state. Okay. So let's say there is some temperature T, for example. If this is temperature T, this line is corresponding to temperature T. And let's say this is corresponding to 0 degree Celsius, for example. Okay. Right now, you can take 0 degree Celsius. For example, let us take. If you apply this for these two locations, you can easily understand enthalpy at state T degree Celsius minus enthalpy at 0 degree Celsius. So this enthalpy difference is equal to Cp times dt. Cp times dt, which is T degree Celsius minus 0 degrees Celsius. Can I write this? Yes or no? Because I have assumed water vapor as ideal gas, this enthalpy at any two points can be taken as enthalpy difference at these two points and enthalpy difference at that two points is nothing but Cp into T minus 0 degrees Celsius. Okay. Now, if you set this, if you see this value Hz, this is Hz, actually Hz at 0 degrees Celsius. If you see the value of Hz at 0 degrees Celsius, this value is roughly from steam tables you can see 2500.9 kilojoule per kg. So this is 2500.9 and in some books for calculation easiness they'll also write 2501 whatever and CP on experimental basis if you check the value this CP value is around 1.82 kilojoule per kg degrees Celsius. T minus 0 is T that means you can see enthalpy of vapor at T degrees Celsius is same as Hz at T degrees Celsius which is equal to if you shift this term to the other side we have 2500.9 plus 1.82 times T degrees Celsius. So this is enthalpy of vapor at any given temperature T actually. Okay. So this is the enthalpy of vapor because of this ideal gas approximation and this understanding of TS diagram. Okay. Now if you see, if you put it back in the given expression, therefore specific enthalpy of moist air is equal to HA plus omega times Hv, we have seen this expression already here, Ha plus omega times Hv. Now Ha is 1.005 T, 1.005 T degrees Celsius plus omega into omega, we have calculated into Hv. So what is the expression for Hv finally we have seen? 2500.9 plus 1.82 T degrees Celsius. That's what we have. Okay. So this is how we get enthalpy or specific enthalpy of moist air. Okay. So this is the expression for specific enthalpy, specific enthalpy of moist air actually here. Okay. So did you understand this? Clear? So please type in the chat box. Is this clear to all of you? Yes or no? Come on guys, quick. Please type in the chat box. Clear to all of you how this is coming? Because we'll actually use this expression of course. Uh, normally for T, you can see in this the only variable is T and omega. These are the two variables. So once you calculate the omega, depending on the temperature, we have certain uh, things called psychometric chart and all, where if we have the combination of T and omega, we'll see in the later stage, we'll uh, look at something called psychometric chart actually. 
if you know this t and omega values you can tell what is this enthalpy okay so that's how psychometric chart is generated between this temperature dial temperature and omega which we will uh, see in the next few minutes okay now let's see we have to identify one important thing dial bulb temperature dbt dry bulb temperature dbt actually okay dry bulb temperature it's normally called dbt now what is this dry bulb this bulb can corresponds to okay so this bulb in this word corresponds to mercury bulb of or bulb of the thermometer bulb of the thermometer actually so normally if you want to measure temperature you will clearly use a thermometer now thermometer has a bulb of mercury so whether the bulb is dry or wet depending on that we decide what is the temperature so dry bulb temperature is nothing but normally if you take a thermometer and if you keep somewhere in this room for example let us say then whatever is the temperature reading in this thermometer that's nothing but the direct dry bulb temperature okay so the actual temperature the actual temperature of moist air moist air is called is called t dry bulb temperature actually okay so d b t of course dry bulb temperature now we also have one more point which is dew point temperature dew point temperature we'll see t d p t it's called t d p t so what is this dew point temperature now let's say if you have saturated air for example or normally if you have air let's say you have air you have air like this t s and where the vapor is lying somewhere here okay so let's say this is the vapor pressure 3.15 kilopascals whatever you say normally this is the pressure which is pv pv okay so this is pv and let's say initially your air is in superheated condition so this is present here okay now normally you see dew points okay formation of this dew points let's say for example if i bring a cooling water bottle if i thoroughly clean that bottle with cloth and if i keep that cooling water bottle in atmosphere after some time you will see definitely dew drops uh, i mean dew points gets formed on this bottle actually okay now what happens is see until the first droplet forms okay so normally you know p total is equal to p total is equal to pa plus pv now within a given air mixture if you want to decrease this p total definitely decreasing this pv and or maybe decreasing this pa how pv is actually decreased basically pv is proportional to mass of vapor present in the atmosphere as yes or no pv is directly proportional to mass of vapor which is present in the atmosphere now if pv is proportional to mass because of condensation if i am trying to remove some water vapor from the moist air then definitely pv drops actually okay but until the water droplet starts coming out as condensed water droplet will there be any change in this p total means let's say i'm trying to cool the gas but that cooling is not sufficient to condense this water okay means it's not sufficient to form water droplets from air until the first water droplet forms from air will there be any change in this pv will there be any change in this pv or maybe p total please type in the chat box until the first water droplet starts falling out of the atmosphere will there be any change in this pv no correct there won't be any change because it remains uh, you know at mv and that corresponds to the pressure of pv okay there is now no pressure drop so if you start cooling this gas what happens the gas starts cooling along this constant pressure curve and it reaches at this point now at this point if you further decrease the temperature to slight amount definitely water starts getting condensed and this is the spot location of formation of first droplet of first droplet actually in that case okay of first droplet 
until this point even though if you are cooling there is no condensation because clearly at any of these locations water is still present in the vapor phase and this is the point where you see the first water droplet on your bottle or whatever okay so at constant pressure this pv what happens this temperature keeps decreasing and this touches this point and you all know basically if something causes beyond this temperature then you will see some formation of wet vapor okay you will see some uh, liquid um, liquid phase here so your dew point temperature tdpt is the temperature at which temperature at which the first the first droplet or dew point droplet or sometimes it's also called dew point appears the first droplet or dew point appears at a given pv at a given p v actually okay so at a given pv now what is this pv i mean what is this tdpt tdpt is nothing but from this diagram you can clearly understand this is nothing but t saturation at pv yes or no so that's the dew point temperature clearly so this is dew point temperature definitely this temperature in general if the a is not saturated this temperature will be less than the actual temperature because you see a is initially present in superheated state this is t dye bulb temperature but this is the corresponding dew point temperature understood if it is not saturated clear yes or no so please type in the chat type the chat box at this point it is saturated definitely okay i mean sorry uh, sorry what i'm telling yeah at this point this condensation begins here okay but this is t dew temperature and this is the t dew point temperature because this is the temperature at this pressure where the first water droplet starts coming out of the atmospheric air okay so is this clear to all of you yeah so type in the chat box is this explanation clear and understandable to all of you now did you all understand why dew point temperature is generally less than this dew bulb temperature actually okay now let's see one very important thing one experimental measure to check how saturated is the air okay normally you know phi is equal to 1 is the ultimate saturation but to what extent is the air saturated that we can understand by uh, doing certain experiment and for that we define one quantity which is called wet bulb temperature wet bulb temperature okay wet bulb temperature actually okay now try to understand this wet bulb temperature what is this wet bulb temperature if you have the thermometer i just want to explain you using some diagram this time and inside you have the small mercury column okay so let's say this is mercury column and clearly you have this mercury inside you have this mercury column and let's say initially when you keep this thermometer in normal atmospheric air okay uh, not understood this see just one minute uh, let us uh, clear the doubts and let's go normally uh, mohit see what happens air will be at this low condition means water vapor in the air will be at this condition it will be in the superheated state and normally the temperature of the air is t dew bulb temperature actually okay if this is t dew bulb temperature then what's happening if you are cooling air okay so let's say for example what happens let's say in this room where air is almost stagnant if i keep a cooling bottle in front of me then definitely what happens after some time this air which is sounding to this uh, bottle gets cooled and the temp they, after some time after some sufficient uh, amount of cooling this water droplet start forming on this bottle correct so what is the temperature at which the first water droplet forms that's nothing but your dew point temperature clear and the first water droplet forms at this particular temperature because even though if you are cooling even though the temperature is decreasing till along this point till you reach this point the complete vapor which is present in the air is in gaseous phase this is the point where you first see the droplet therefore tdpt is nothing but saturation temperature corresponding to this pv okay now so let's say if i keep this air 
if this if i keep this thermometer in normal room i'll have some reading which is t dye bulb temperature yes or no so this is t dye bulb temperature now this temperature or t w b t wet bulb temperature actually so t wet bulb temperature is a measure of phi actually okay and more than this we'll see something called wet bulb depression wet bulb depression which is w b p wet bulb depression is equal to dew point i mean this dye bulb temperature minus wet bulb temperature actually okay wet bulb temperature now try to get one point here normally if you keep this thermometer in air you will have some dye bulb temperature now let's say if i wrap a wet cotton to this okay so let's say this is wet cotton wick okay and let's say the air which is surrounded is unsaturated unsaturated air we have unsaturated air particles here okay so unsaturated air now when you have this unsaturated air and let's say this is wet cotton wick if there is some amount of water in this cotton wick wick is like a, you know uh, some cotton bunch of cotton kind of thing okay so this is wet cotton wick then if this air is not saturated it's unsaturated i have told you something something similar to this will happen as yes or no correct if this air is unsaturated and if this is the cotton wick for example and if you have water molecules on the cotton wick and also somewhere inside then definitely if the air is unsaturated this water molecules will increase correct this water molecules which are here gets evaporated so similarly what happens here is this water molecules which are here on the surface they easily get evaporated evaporated initially everything is at room temperature at equilibrium now this is evaporated if this is evaporated for the evaporation of this molecule it takes some energy from this unsaturated air and also from this particular water wet cotton wick now tell me one thing if the energy from this wet cotton wick is going out what happens to this temperature let's say when evaporating of this water molecule if this water molecule is taking energy from unsaturated air and also this wet cotton wick if energy is going out of this wet cotton wick because of evaporation taking place at all these points at all these points evaporation happens because all of this are in direct contact with atmosphere and cotton wick has pores so once this molecule gets out then some other molecule travels outside okay so if this evaporation process is taking place what happens to this t dye bulb temperature it will decays correct right? so temperature decays definitely so this temperature decays and finally once it reaches the saturation condition we get this wet bulb temperature and this depression this is wet bulb depression which i have written there okay so the difference between dye bulb temperature and the wet bulb temperature and this process continues until this air gets uh, you know uh, either the cotton wick don't have any more enough water or maybe the air gets saturated one of these things to sh should happen for this evaporation to stop actually okay now let us see now how this can measure actually wet bulb depression is a measure of phi actually okay so wet bulb depression is a measure of phi how this can actually measure phi look if air is saturated if air is saturated let's say you have wet cotton wick but this air is already saturated air means you cannot this air cannot take any more water into this into the air itself okay so let's say if this air is saturated then definitely will this water i mean will this water molecules evaporate come on please tell me if this air is already saturated air which is surrounding this wick then will there be any evaporation from this cotton wick type in the chat box if air is saturated then will there be any evaporation from this cotton wick no if there is no evaporation will there be any fall in the temperature if there is no evaporation taking place then will there be any fall in this temperature no correct temperature won't fall because the things which are initially at the room conditions say i mean uh, there okay so therefore this wet bulb depression wet bulb depression is equal to zero so that means your t dye bulb temperature is same as t wet bulb temperature actually here okay so this is t wet bulb temperature so t dye bulb temperature is same as t wet bulb temperature because no evaporation happens 
from the cotton week because no because no evaporation happens from cotton week from cotton week so indirectly you can understand one thing this difference or if this gap is large that means initially the phi of this value or the phi of this air is much less okay if this person is zero that means initially this is a saturated air so depending on this scaling of course this is just a measure i didn't give you the equations and all this dip, wet bulb depression talks about the level of saturation of this air yes or no if this is straight away zero this is 100 percent saturated if that value is somewhere you know somewhere thing uh, let's say for example some uh, five five degrees Celsius or four degrees Celsius, something like this. Then definitely this air is unsaturated, and we can decide depending upon this uh, calculations which we see further. Okay. So is this clear to all of you? Did you all get these points? Yes. Pritam, Exo, Sukuma, Vivek, Modit, Suman, Yogesh, Loha, Aspent, Mohit, every one of you. Yeah, is phi, then phi is one definitely correct because this is saturated. Saturated that means phi is hundred percent, which is one. Okay, that's all clear. So this is what you have. Also, in case of saturated conditions, I want to tell you one more point. Look, let's say if the air is at saturated conditions, at saturated conditions. Let's say for example, if this A is saturated conditions, at saturated conditions, if you slightly decrease the temperature of air, okay, let's say if this A is saturated, that means at this given temperature, this air has already got enough number of water molecules, okay, it has already got maximum number of water molecules. From this point, if I slightly reduce temperature by one degree Celsius, what do you feel will happen? I told you PV is directly proportional to temperature. So if temperature is slightly decreasing, then pressure should also slightly decrease. So for pressure of the vapor to slightly decrease, something should happen. What is that? Something should happen here. Let's say if this air is saturated air, then definitely this dry temperature is also equal to one more temperature. What is that? Yes, exactly. Condensation should happen. Therefore, for saturated air, for saturated air, dry bulb temperature is actually equal to dew point temperature. Because, yes, condensation should happen, correct? Look, it should be equal to dew point temperature. The reason is, see, already I have some amount of air which has got maximum amount of water vapor. At that point, if I slightly decrease the temperature of air by some small amount, the water vapor carrying capacity of air also slightly decreases. That means some amount of water should definitely get condensed and it should get out of the mixture actually. Okay, So that means at that particular temperature, if you slightly decrease the temperature, then definitely condensation happens. That means the actual temperature at the saturated state is also same as the dew point temperature. Clear? So therefore, at saturated, for saturated air, for saturated air, for saturated air, T dry bulb temperature is equal to T dew point temperature is same as T wet bulb temperature. Did you all understand how these three are equal? Yes or no? Because many people they just mug up this equation but they don't know why it is. But now I hope you got certain clear understanding why these two are equal first of all. Also why these two are equal then all three are equal. Got it? Yes or no? So please type in the chat box. Is this clear to all of you? Yes, got it? Nice. So after this, now how to calculate this omega? That's the most important stuff, OK? So what is omega? How we will actually calculate this? Calculate omega, OK? So omega can be calculated in this way but who tells you PV and who tells you phi that's the main important story so for calculating that we do something some experimentation and we define some quantity called adiabatic saturation temperature okay so what is this adiabatic saturation temperature let us see this is some important phenomena after this we'll move to uh, our psychometric process okay but first let us see 
एडियाबैटिक सैचुरेशन टेम्परेचर एडियाबैटिक सैचुरेशन टेम्परेचर सो वॉट इज दिस एडियाबैटिक सैचुरेशन टेम्परेचर दिस इज एक्चुअली अ टेक्निक फॉर मेजरिंग योर फाइव ऑफकोर्स ऑन ओमेगा एक्चुअली सो दिस इज यूज to measure omega 1 i mean to measure omega and phi of a given moist air of a given moist air not measure calculate sorry this is used to calculate because we can calculate actually we cannot measure directly calculate omega phi of a given moisture moist air okay of a given moist air fine so let's see what is the technique what is the saturation temperature and how we can actually measure omega and phi actually okay for that we need a apparatus okay so we need a apparatus actually just a minute okay so this is how you have okay fine fine now let's see this is completely adiabatic okay so this is completely adiabatic we don't do any heat transfer we don't allow any heat transfer to happen now let's say here you have a thick layer of water film okay so you got a water film actually here it's a actually it's a thin film but just for your understanding i am enlarging it okay so let's say this is a thin water film very thin water film now let's say some amount of air which you are sending in is at a temperature t1 omega 1 and also phi 1 actually okay so normally if you take any air it has certain omega certain phi and also certain temperature now what this air molecules do what this air molecules do here is actually this chamber is sufficiently good enough this chamber is of such large length such that now try to understand one thing guys by the time this air flows in this direction let's say if this air is unsaturated somewhere here okay so this is unsaturated immediately what happens during the course of this air it starts picking up water molecules into this as yes or no it starts picking up water molecules into this and after some time if the chamber is long enough that at some location it gets saturated then whatever the water is entering that will again get condensed here okay so whatever the water is entering here that get condensed finally the mixture what you are going to get is at phi 2 which is equal to 100% which means we are doing the saturation of this air at adiabatic conditions that's why it is adiabatic saturation understood so we are actually saturating this air which is entering at some relative velocity l2 uh, humidity of phi 1 and specific humidity of omega 1 to finally in a long chamber we are making it phi 2 is equal to 100 and it has got some t2 and also omega 2 of course okay so t2 and also omega 2 now let's see t2 and omega 2 clearly there is some input of water into this some input of water water is actually sent inside because see air is carrying some amount of water so after some time what happens this water level will decrease and for further air which is coming there won't be enough water so to accommodate that we are actually sending this water continuously inside such that this apparatus is working under steady state is this clear first of all are you all clear with the setup how we are actually creating saturation of this air under adiabatic conditions is this clear to all of you yes or no can you all understand how we are creating saturation of this unsaturated air under adiabatic conditions i'll show you how you can calculate this omega 1 and phi 1 but right now is it clear to all of you yes okay as or no so please type in the chat box clear yeah now let's see if i take this control volume for analyzing 
the stuff. So let's say this is control vol my control volume. I am trying to analyze this control volume. This device is my control volume and liquid is actually entering in at this point. Okay, maybe somewhere here. So you can see this liquid is actually entering this point here. It's cutting the control surface. If we apply mass balance first, mass balance for control volume, it's under steady state. It is under steady state operation. Okay, so device is under steady state operation. So in your steady flow energy equation, I'm not considering any rate of change of energy with time and rate of change of mass with time. So device is under steady state. device is under steady state okay now if device is under steady state look what happens if we apply mass balance for die air for die air can i say for die air let's say for example this mixture is of mass flow rate m dot out of which m dot a1 is the mass flow rate of die air this will also be same as final so let's write it as m dot a okay because from this inlet to outlet maybe something in the mass of the water is changing but nothing corresponding to the mass of dye air is changing okay so whatever is the amount of dye air which is flowing here same amount of dye air can actually come out at that point similarly for water vapor for water vapor you can see for water vapor if you can understand see mass of vapor in the first state plus let's say if m dot f is the rate of net rate of evaporation into the cycle plus m dot f this will be equal to mass of water which is available okay m dot f is the rate net rate of evaporation net rate of evaporation net rate of this evaporation clearly okay so this m dot f is the net rate of evaporation if net rate of evaporation is m dot f means air is taking this m dot f amount of water to compensate that this also should be m dot f yes or no so the mass inflow should also be m dot f yes can i say this because out of this water which is available m dot f is taken by this air from omega 1 to omega 2 then definitely that m dot f will be losing uh, uh, mf amount of water will be losing per second to compensate that this inlet rate of liquid should be same as the evaporation rate at this point okay now how you can write this omega 1 i mean this m dot v1 this can be written as omega 1 into m dot a1 which is m dot a plus m dot f is equal to because omega is mass of vapor by mass of air so this mass of vapor can be written as omega 2 times m dot a actually here so this talks about m dot f is equal to omega 2 minus omega 1 times m dot a actually okay omega 2 minus omega 1 times this m dot a actually here this is the rate of evaporation and that's the amount of water which you are feeding into this device actually from mass ba mass balance okay so this is mass balance for dye and also for water vapor okay so this quantity is rate of evaporation rate of evaporation or feed supply now let's see t1 and t2 can measure directly by putting two thermometers at this point and that point you can get t1 and t2 okay phi 2 you already know it is 100 if phi 2 is also 100 look then energy balance if you apply energy balance here if you apply energy balance then let's see what happens now clearly q dot minus w dot is equal to delta ke dot plus delta pe dot plus delta h dot all these things now clearly this is zero because it is insulated zero because this is insulated and clearly this device is producing no work and compared to enthalpies if you neglect these two guys neglecting this kinetic and potential differences this gives you h dot in should be same as h dot out actually here okay so h dot in is same as h dot out okay now let's also understand one thing what is h dot in okay see this m dot a mass flow rate okay because clearly the actual mass which is flowing in is m dot a1 plus m dot v1 but m dot v1 is very much less so what we can see is m dot a1 is the mass which is flowing in inside okay so m dot a into h1 
plus, you can also see this liquid is also entering this control volume. When liquid is entering, definitely it has got some enthalpy. So let's say the enthalpy is HF correspondingly. Okay. So this liquid of HF enthalpy, HF specific enthalpy is also causing this control surface and going inside the control volume. So plus M dot F into HF. So this should be equal to M H dot out. So what is H dot out? The thing which is coming out of the control volume is actually this at uh, this uh, stream at this point. So you can see M dot A plus M dot F because this will be the complete mixture which will be coming out at this point. Okay, because if M dot A is here, this M dot F amount of water is being carried forward. So this M dot F into H2. So what is this H2? So let's see this. This is the total amount of uh, you know moist air which is coming out. So M dot A H1 plus and H1. What is the expression for H1? We can see. Or if you first divide with M dot A the complete equation, you can see H1 plus M dot F by M dot A times HF is equal to 1 plus M dot F by M dot A times of H2 actually. Now, if you write this H1 in terms of your properties, 1.005 T1 plus omega 1 times of omega 1 times of plus omega 1 times of uh, 2501, let us say, plus 1.82 T1 degrees Celsius plus this m dot f by m dot a, m dot f by m dot a times hf, hf actually is equal to 1 plus m dot f by m dot a into your h2 is nothing but t 1.005 t2 degree celsius plus omega 2 times of 2501 plus 1.82 t2 degrees celsius so this is the equation that is with you finally okay just i haven't done anything in terms of enthalpy because you know the enth expression for enthalpy of moist air is this uh, 1.005 t plus omega 1 all this stuff now in this equation you can easily calculate omega 2 how come because omega 2 is equal to 0 0.622 pv by p total minus pv you know you can easily measure this total atmospheric pressure with the help of a pressure gauge and at state 2 since a is completely saturated a is saturated 100 percent so a is saturated so definitely at state 2 if a is saturated this phi 2 is equal to 100 percent so phi 2 is equal to 1 this implies your pv is same as pv saturation at t2 correct which you can get from the steam tables easily okay so pv is nothing but p saturation at this point t2 or pvs which is nothing but p saturation at t2 degrees celsius of course we have seen in calculating phi okay so when you are calculating phi if this is the expression that we have this is pvs this is pvs can you calculate omega 2 yes or no so please type in the chat box can i calculate omega 2 from this equation yes or no guys come on quick can i calculate omega 2 from this equation because i know all the stuff i can just put it in and i can calculate this now if i can calculate omega 2 look i can also measure t1 and t2 just put two thermometers at the inlet and outlet you can get temperatures directly so t1 and t2 so t2 can be identified T1 can be identified. Mass flow rate of vapor, I mean this M dot F and M dot A are known to you clearly because you know how much air you are sending inside the adiabatic chamber. Also, depending on here, maybe if you put some uh, flow meter or something here, you can also get what is this M dot F. This M dot F by M dot A is clearly known to you. Okay. Then, once you know these quantities, T2 is known, omega 2 is also known to you. Okay. So, this is also known. Now, in this equation, there is only one unknown. What is that? In this complete equation, where there is only one unknown, what is that unknown actually? In this complete equation, there is only one unknown. If you see, rest of the things are known to you. One unknown is not known to you actually. I mean, there is only one unknown in this equation. 
what is that you can see everything is known apart from one term which is come on type it in the chat box which is this term omega 1 correct t2 is known now because if you put a temperature if you put a thermometer at the exit you will easily identify what is t2 that's actually your adiabatic saturation temperature okay so t2 is your adiabatic saturation temperature this is the temperature of the adiabatically saturated air t2 is adiabatic saturation temperature adiabatic saturation temperature yeah understood so because hf also you know see some of you may feel i don't know what is this hf because see if you know the temperature of this water because you can put one more thermometer then hf normally this temperature will be made equal to t2 so that saturation happens effective so but anyway if this is at some different temperature also this hf can be easily taken from the steam tables because you know what is the temperature of this air i mean temperature of this water which is flowing in okay normally this temperature will be made equal to t2 okay so that generally if it's uh, you know uh, t2 then definitely what happens this evaporation rate because t2 is not att attained till this point so definitely evaporation rate increases and it gets saturated faster that's it okay so you can calculate hf and this omega 1 is not known to you so this implies omega 1 is only unknown is only unknown and you have one equation with one unknown you can simplify this that's how you can actually calculate omega 1 which is nothing but omega of the given air mixture and if you know omega 1 clearly omega 1 is equal to 0 0.622 pv by p total minus pv and you can calculate what is the atmospheric pressure at location 1 then if you know this omega 1 is known this p total is known only one equation you can get pv so pv can be calculated from this pv 1 in the state 1 can be calculated if pv 1 is calculated then you can calculate phi easily phi is equal to PV1 by P saturation at 1, PV sat or P sat at T1. You can do this at T1 degree Celsius. So you can also calculate phi 1. So that's how you can calculate omega phi of any given moist air sample for you. Understood? Okay. So is this clear to each and every one? So please type in the chat box, is this understanding of calculating omega and phi clear to each and every one of you? What is this symbol for? I didn't get you. Okay, you're telling, fine, good. Okay, now I'll also go for one more thing actually, which could be important sometimes. Okay, so yeah. Adiabatic mixing of two streams of, okay. I'll uh, better do this after teaching psychometric chart because I want to show you on psychometric chart also. So let's see. Psychometric chart. So what is this psychometric chart? Normally, uh, so how are questions framed from this? They'll ask you a lot of theoretical questions. They'll, uh, of course, I have one, two questions which maybe if time permits, I'll do. Otherwise, I'll give it as homework. You please try them. Uh, in tomorrow's class, I'll try to discuss this. Okay? Clear? So I have set some questions here, some psychometric chart, then uh, humidity stream of moist air okay so supply of air all this uh, stuff so basically you can work out those questions if you can understand this story effectively you can easily solve those questions nothing much okay fine see guys only thing that you need is little uh, you know uh, what do you say patience in doing this you see n is there anything complicated in this which i have done don't look at the diagram and all it's very big and all nothing like that okay you see the maths involved and the equations which we are generating is there anything big in this simple logic and pure division multiplication stuff that's it okay i think you can easily understand okay i'm not doing anything big stuff here okay so just putting it this side that side adjusting division all this multiplication division basic third class fourth class stuff i'm doing okay but just with not with numbers with variables algebra fifth class sixth class maybe okay so anyway so let us see what is this psychometric chart so this psychometric chart is actually very useful in calculations because 
if i give you some temperature and if i give you some omega then definitely you will put it in the formula 1.005 plus t plus omega into all the things and you will calculate the enthalpy but by looking at this table or by looking at this chart psychometric chart you can actually the study of moisture is called psychometry of course so by looking at this psychometric chart you can directly spot what could be the enthalpy okay so let's see this chart is plotted between dye bulb temperature and omega so this is plotted between this dye bulb temperature and omega on this plot okay so this is omega clear guys i can tell you one thing 100% confidently after attending these classes if any of you might have attempted solving pyqs you will very easily get answers of all the pyqs definitely some of you might have tried you can just open and open the pyq book like i have shown you the other day you can just open the pyq book and if you start attempting the questions you will definitely get the answers very very easily if some of you might have tried you can share your experience okay so see here anyway this chart is plotted between this omega and also it's normally in, in, in a box like structure so what you have here is dye bulb temperature dry bulb temperature in degree celsius and here on this side you have omega which is kg of vapor per kg of dye normally sometimes uh, you know they will draw the graph accordingly grams of vapor by kg of dye whatever okay you are solving nitin getting answers easily okay fine so anyway psychometric chart we are drawing yeah psychometric chart now if you see this is the saturation curve corresponding to 100% saturation phi is equal to 100% actually okay phi is equal to 100% now we have an enthalpy scale at this point which is looking like this you have an enthalpy scale which points like this on this you got certain readings So some scale like this, okay? So this scale is for specific enthalpy, H. Specific enthalpy, H actually, okay? Because you know, you got this formula, H is equal to 1.005 T, which is normal temperature of air. Normally in this case, you put the temperature in degrees Celsius, okay? Because this values per degree Celsius or per degree Kelvin is same actually, okay? So you see in baton cycle and all, we'll put the values in CP, okay? Of course, because of iso isentropic relations and all, we calculate in Kelvin. But you all see, when you multiply the CP, CP into temperature difference, CV into temperature difference, you'll get this kind of formulas. When you are doing temperature difference, it degrees Celsius or Kelvin doesn't matter. So in this formula, we always keep this T in degrees Celsius because the values are set accordingly. Okay, 1.2501, 1.82, these are set accordingly. So therefore, omega times 2501 or 2500.9, whatever plus 1.82 T degree Celsius. Okay, so this is what you have. Now, if I give you a sample of moist air, and if I ask you what is the specific enthalpy, I should give you two things. One is T and another is omega. So that's how the start is between T and omega clearly. Now let's say, for example, at this point, there is some temperature, say 35 degree Celsius or something, and there is some omega. I have also given you what is omega actually. If I give you these two things, then clearly you can spot out what is the enthalpy actually here at this location? If you draw a line parallelly onto the enthalpy scale, you can get the reading here, maybe some 2580, something like this. So you can spot what is the specific enthalpy at this point. So lines of constant enthalpy will be something like this. This is how you have the lines of constant enthalpy. So H is equal to constant along these lines, which is perpendicular to this scale, of course. Okay. And also, you know, if omega is decreasing, and if t is increasing normally if t is increasing this quantity increases. if omega is decreasing it decreases okay so normally this has a negative slope for d omega by dt if you normally write if you differentiate this and if you calculate dt by dt by d omega you will find out a line with negative slope okay just a bit of maths you can do so if you make h is equal to constant so dh is equal to 1.005 dt plus omega times 1.82 dt plus t times d omega so if you do this stuff 
and if dh is equal to 0, then clearly you can see 1.005 uh, plus omega times 1.82 plus t times uh, d omega. So if you calculate d omega by dt, clearly you know if you are trying to get this ratio, one of these two terms will go to the left hand side and there comes a minus sign. So the lines of constant enthalpy will be something like this with respect to the temperature axis. Clear? Just a bit of basic calculus. First single differentiation, one variable differentiation. Okay. Now, so let us see the other things. Also, now this is dial temperature and this is uh, h is equal to constant actually okay and normally we do this uh, for identifying dew point temperatures uh, constant volume lines everything okay i'll just show you one actual psychrometric chart because we are using digital board let's take the advantage of this psychrometric chart psychrometric chart pdf yeah better okay so maybe i'll show some images in which you can get some good idea yeah maybe this is good enough to understand some basic things can you all see this? Okay. So normally if you see, this is plotted for omega. Okay. You can see weight of water vapor in one pound of dye. Of course, units can change depending on the uh, things that we are taking. So this is actually the temperature. Okay. So this is 30, 35, 40 and all. And clearly these lines, yellow lines, I think they could be of uh, wet bulb temperatures. And where is this enthalpy lines, constant enthalpy? I think it's not uh, given here. Maybe this psychometric chart, let us see if they might have given. I'll show you. Let's take some industrial charts also. That's much better in this sense. I think you're not able to see much, okay? But uh, I hope you can see this chart, at least the first chart better, okay? So you see different lines on this chart are given actually, okay? So moisture quantity. So constant moisture lines are these green colored lines, of course, okay? And constant temperature lines are these blue color lines, okay? You can see dye bulb temperature. They'll be vertical and clearly moisture content, which is omega will be horizontal actually, okay? And if you calculate uh, phi and of course other things, relative humidity, then wet bulb temperatures, dew point temperatures, you can plot different lines depending on the calculations that you have, okay? And also, so if you understand one point here, try to get this. For example, if you have two lines which are perpendicular to this, okay? So along this direction, if I say phi 1 and phi 2, of course I have given hint already, but out of these phi 1 and phi 2, which do you think is higher? Which, you do, which do you think is more? Out of phi 1 and phi 2, which do you think is more actually? Which is large out of these two, phi 1 and phi 2? Phi 1, correct? Yes? 1. Because if I change this to 3, it should engage like this. Correct? So phi 1 is actually large. And of course, you can also identify this from other source. Phi 1 is equal to PV1 by P saturated 1 and phi 2 is equal to PV2 by P saturated 2 actually here. Okay? And PV1, if you write in terms of omega, omega equal to 0 0.62 to PV1, all this stuff, you will clearly understand at a given temperature, means if you check at these two points, for example, if these two points are at same type of temperature, but clearly this omega 1 and this is omega 2. So omega 1 is greater than omega 2. This clearly gives you some idea that this PV2 will be less actually. If you do omega equal to 0 0.62 to PV by P, P total minus PV set, all this stuff, if you see this, you'll understand phi 2 will be less than phi 1 actually here. Okay, so phi 2 is of course less than phi 1. Okay, but majority, we of course calculate dew point temperatures, all these things using the chart, like you can see here. This is the dew point temperature lines. Okay, the lines which are inclined like this, you can see this, these are these green lines are a bit inclined actually. Okay, so those inclined lines are the dew point temperature lines, and these lines will be generally parallel, almost parallel to omega lines. Okay, so constant omega uh, lines actually. Okay, now and yeah we have said, talked about relative humidity phi lines okay then dew point temperature wet bulb dye bulb all these things fine now using this we will be able to identify what is the type of process that is happening in 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 normal psychometrics okay so let us see few psychometric process before we uh, end this okay I repeat again sir yeah i'm repeating normally if you take this phi phi is equal to pv by pv saturation okay at given temperature, PV saturation at given temperature, okay? And also we have omega is equal to 0.62 to PV 
by P total minus PV. From this expression, if you try to generate expression for PV, I'll just show you. See here. Omega times P total minus PV is equal to 0 0.622 PV. So your omega is equal to or omega not omega sorry PV is equal to so PV is equal to omega times P total divided by omega plus 0 0.622 is what you'll get. Okay. And if you simplify this omega, now tell me one thing. If omega increases, if omega increases, tell me if omega is increasing, this total quantity will decrease. Yes or no? If this total quantity is decreasing, then this will increase. Means you can understand, and phi is directly proportional to PV because if these two points I take at the same temperature, then clearly this is same in both the cases. Okay, because T is not changing, so this is same, and phi is directly proportional to PV. If PV is increasing, phi increases. Means as omega decreases, you know, uh, sorry, as omega increases, if omega increases, PV increases, if PV increases, phi increases, okay. So that's why normally if you take these two curves of phi 1 and phi 2, then at a given temperature, at a given temperature, if you take two different values of omega, definitely phi corresponding to higher omega will be highest. That's how phi 1 is greater than phi 2 or phi 2 is less than phi 1, whatever. Okay, Suman, so got it? Clear? Good. So anyway, I'll just leave this so that you can understand. Now let us see, there is some basic process which we do in day-to-day -day life, okay? So sensible heating, sensible cooling, humidification, dehumidification, all this stuff. So let's see. First, I'll define these statements. Heating, as you know, increasing temperature, increasing temperature, cooling is decreasing temperature you know this okay and humidification humidification is like so what about humidification increasing the moisture content and dehumidification dehumidification is like decreasing omega okay so normally when you do you say it's highly humid actually okay humidification is basically something like Normally, you, you, you might have heard this, the humidity is very high today, which means you will be sweating so much, okay? So, why you are sweating so much? Because the air which is surrounding me, let's say for example, if I am sweating so much, okay? Then, air which is surrounding me is already saturated, that's why it is not able to take away my sweat particles effectively, understood? So, if this air surrounding me is highly saturated, then it won't be easy for atmospheric air to take sweat particles away from me, okay? So, if I'm feeling very humid, that means there is high amount of water content in the air which is present. So normally, humidification is further increasing of air, uh, this water vapor. Dehumidification is something taking out water vapor, okay? Let's say, for example, if I keep the cool water bottle, for example, here, then what's happening? This cool water bottle is cooling this air. At the same time, it will also condense some amount of water vapor. That means it is taking out water vapor from air. That means this cooling, what actually you're doing is cooling with dehumidification, understood? You are cooling the air along with dehumidifying it. If you cool below a temperature, if you cool to a temperature below the dew point temperature, then definitely hum dehumidification happens. Condensation starts starts happening and water particles come out of the air actually. Okay. So anyway, let's discuss this process in a bit understandable way. Sensible heating. Sensible heating. So sensible is no phase change, only pure heating. Okay. So sensible heating. So if you do sensible heating, how you do normally? Let's say you have this duct, for example, some air duct is there, air is flowing, and you have a heater coil. So this is a heating coil, for example. Okay. So this is heating coil. If you have this heating coil, okay. So this is your heating coil. And let's say some amount of y, a, sorry, A is flowing in M dot A1. And let's say M dot A2 is flowing out. And let's say this is insulated clearly. Normally this is sensible heating because I want some clear amount of information on heat transfer. So I'm insulating it. Otherwise what happens? The purpose of your heating is to increase the temperature. If you don't insulate, this hot air will again lose heat. Okay, that should not be there. Now, clearly, if this is the control volume, if this is your control volume, 
okay so this is your control volume then let's see if you apply mass balance mass balance for die air for die air m dot a1 is equal to m dot a2 which is also same as m dot a because nothing from nowhere a is again coming in also for water vapor for vapor for vapor just tell me whatever is the water vapor going in will it be same as to yes or no because you see there is nothing which is wave water is not taken out and also water is not given inside okay there is no addition of water at the same time there is no taking out of water so clearly you can see this both will be same correct sorry didn't get this mhf means what is mhf didn't get uh, you aloha so what is mhf something okay so please elaborate what is mhf meanwhile so this will be same because whatever vapor is entering same amount of vapor will also be present here because like in the case of adiabatic saturation you don't have any water input or something here okay so just you have uh, you, ha you have enclosed this and you are purely heating this if you are purely heating this then you can see enthalpy okay so let's say this is qs added qs which is added because of heating so this is qs actually here so if you do see qs if you apply energy balance energy balance okay then clearly you can see this also tells you one thing omega 1 into m dot a is equal to omega 2 into m dot a so this tells you that m dot a and m dot a gets eliminated and omega 1 is equal to omega 2 in case of sensible heating okay because clearly no water vapor is being added so for the given given amount of air water vapor is not changing so omega 1 is equal to omega 2 and in and the energy balance if you write m dot a sorry m dot a h1 plus q dot s let us say total heat supplied q dot s is equal to let us write uh, this as q dot s q dot s then this guy is equal to m dot a into h2 so which means clearly you can say q dot s heat supplied by this coil is equal to m dot a times h2 minus h1 actually and if you convert h2 as 1.005 t uh, sensible heating okay sensible heating is called as mhf okay maybe i don't know but normally as far as my knowledge i call it sensible heating okay so this is q dot s so this is the amount of heat which is added in this particular portion okay so heat added heat added to air to air okay and this temperature is t1 degree celsius then clearly you will identify this is t2 degree celsius how come how do you know t2 is more than t1 you are doing heating first of all also if you convert this h2 minus h1 in terms of 1.005 t2 minus t1 plus omega into 1.82 t2 minus t1 then clearly you will understand since heat added to the system is positive this t2 minus t1 will come out as positive okay because mass flow rate of a is positive anyhow due to heating coil of course due to heating coil and also mathematically you can see if you just expand this you will see this is positive and t2 minus t1 not directly cp if you write that expression uh, you know 1.005 t plus omega 2501 if you write all this stuff you will understand t2 minus t1 you can take common the rest of the thing in the bracket is positive so t2 minus t1 is also positive t2 is greater than t1 actually okay so how do you represent this in a psychometric chart let us see that sensible heating in psychometric chart is sensible heating in this psychometric chart will be something like okay so this is t dye bulb temperature so this is omega kg of vapor this is degree celsius and this is kg of vapor per kg of dye air okay so this is kg of dye air actually now let's see if you have this for example omega and t dbt t dye bulb temperature and this is omega line of some constant omega line of some constant omega let's say this is 
omega. Now, sensible heating, during sensible heating, there is no change in omega. You can see mathematical analysis has shown omega 1 is equal to omega 2. So, you start somewhere here and you end up somewhere here. This is 2 actually. Okay. So, omega 1 is uh, omega one is equal to omega 2. So, initially you have your T1, something like this and this is your T2 and T2 is definitely more than your T1 of course. Okay. So, T2 is more than T1. Then, let's see. 1 to 2 is this process okay so 1 to 2 is this process of heat addition 1 to 2 is this process of heat addition sensible heating of course clearly you can understand one important point if you take the line of constant phi it will be something like this and one more line of constant phi will be something like this so clearly if you see phi 1 is greater than phi 2 okay so in case of sensible heating in sensible heating insensible heating phi decreases okay because you see as you go in this direction phi will actually come down okay and if you take constant enthalpy for example if you see this is the increasing direction of enthalpy so this point will give h1 and this point will give h2 actually sorry okay so this point will give h2 and this gap between these two guys so this gap is like h2 minus h1 and this is the heating effect per unit okay per unit mass of mass flow rate and this if you multiply with m dot a is equal to q dot s actually okay but of course let's not write directly here because again this gives you only the specific enthalpy difference okay so q dot s is equal to m dot a times h2 minus h1 actually here got it yes or no so please type in the chat box okay now let us see one more case sensible cooling and also dehumidification also let us see because these guys are important a bit so sensible cooling first of all because I want to define one factor also here, bypass factor, which you might have studied some time back. So, sensible cooling actually, okay. So, what is this sensible cooling? Let us see. Like again, if you have this setup, something like this. You have this cooling coil. Guys, these are important a bit, so please see carefully. If you have a cooling coil like this, so this is cooling coil, cooling coil, maybe somewhere inside you are circulating some very cool fluid, okay. Now, let's see again, some amount of air is coming in, m dot a, and the sun temperature of this surface of the cooling coil is Ts, Ts is surface temperature of cooling coil, of cooling coil surface temperature of cooling coil and let's say Ts is greater than dew point temperature okay so this is sensible which means no dehumidification is happening this is just cooling okay so sometimes what happens if this Ts is much less than this dpt then definitely air when it passes through this it gets condensed okay like in your refrigerators and all but let's say as of now there is nothing happening here so Ts is greater than tpt now in this case you see air actually flows again at m dot a because there is no dehumidification no dehumidification no dehumidification okay so no dehumidification clearly now if there is no dehumidification understand one thing again if you apply mass balance mass balance gives you something like m dot a1 is equal to m dot a2 which is same as m dot a means if i take this as state 1 conditions at this section and this as state 2 conditions at this point and clearly it is again insulated you know we will generally insulate this always ok so we insulate this so if you insulate this this is for air ok so this is for dry air now for vapor let us see for vapor what you have m dot v1 is equal to 
since there is no condensation which is taking place definitely this m dot v1 is same as m dot v2 so m dot v2 clearly this is omega 1 times m dot a is equal to omega 2 times m dot a clearly and if you eliminate this m dot a and m dot a again you will see omega 1 is equal to omega 2 in this case omega 1 is equal to omega 2 in this case now if you take this as your control volume for example so this is your control volume control volume okay so this guy if you take it as your control volume if you again apply energy balance let's see what hap what happens here energy balance if you again apply this energy balance then let's see so clearly steady state enthalpy going in is equal to and sorry q dot minus w dot is equal to change in kinetic energies plus potential plus delta h dot okay now this is zero it's producing no work and if you neglect these guys neglect now this is cooling coil so from this control volume heat will actually flow out okay so let's say q dot is flowing out so a q dot s let us say it's flowing out actually so minus q dot s is equal to change in enthalpy m dot a times h2 minus h1 actually okay so there is a negative sign so if you invert them heat lost q dot s to the cooling coil will be equal to m dot a times h1 minus h2 that's it okay and if you try to understand clearly if you again write this h1 as 1.005 t plus omega into 2501 all this stuff you will understand t1 minus t2 is going to be positive that means temperature is going to decrease actually okay so this is what you get q dot s is equal to m dot a times h2 minus h1 and this leads to t1 minus t2 will be negative and sorry this is positive of course because yeah we have inverted so t1 minus t2 is negative so t1 is actually greater than t2 and temperature cools by default okay so temperature will actually decrease and air will cool if you plot it on a psychometric chart you will see so see i'm plotting it on a psychometric chart actually if you plot it on psychometric chart of course so this is omega and this is t di bulb temperature in degree celsius then if this is t1 and if you take the line of constant omega first so if you take a line of constant omega if you take a line of constant omega then in this case you have state 1 here and state 2 here i mean this is state 1 actually and state 2 then this sensible cooling happens in this particular direction okay so you can see this is the direction of sensible cooling 1 to 2 actually here okay and this is 1 to 2 then definitely enthalpy will decrease clearly h1 minus h2 will be positive that means h2 is less than h1 so enthalpy will decrease also specific humidity will actually increase okay sorry this uh, relative humidity will actually increase because you can see clearly this is what we have because if temperature is decreasing then pv sat further decreases if pv sat decreases phi increases Uh, sorry didn't get so please take more slide more slide okay I'll just do this in the next slide better see here yeah okay so you have this fine If you have this chart, then this is your omega and this is your dry bulb temperature, okay, in degree Celsius and this is kg vapor per kg di air, okay, so per kg of di air. Now, if you have the line of constant omega, so this is line of constant omega actually, okay, then you know at constant omega temperature should decrease. So if it starts somewhere here, it should end at this point, okay, so T1 to T2 decreases. So the process happens along this direction 1 to 2 okay so clearly if this is t1 this is t2 and your temperature will actually decrease if temperature decreases then you can understand if you draw lines of constant humidity i mean this constant relative humidity this is phi1 and phi sorry phi2 and this is phi1 clearly 
this phi 2 is greater than phi 1. The reason for this is you can see omega is not changing. So if omega is not changing, total pressure remains same, PV remains same. But when temperature decreases, PVS decreases. So definitely phi 2 will be more. See, phi is PV by PV saturation actually. Okay. So PV divided with PV sat. Now as temperature decreases at constant omega, at constant omega, clearly PV is constant. Correct? Because P total is constant. This is chart completely at one atmosphere pressure. So even though some small amount of water vapor is there, so P total doesn't change because no dehumidification, nothing. But this guy, as temperature decreases, PV sat decreases. So this implies phi increases. Okay. So clearly you can also see from the psychometric chart, the curve goes from lesser phi to higher phi. Okay. So phi increases and enthalpy is less. Now here I want to define one quantity which is normally called bypass factor. Cooling bypass factor. Cooling bypass factor which is normally called X sometimes in uh, you know one mark questions of ISR and all they can ask you. So what is this bypass factor? Look, if the coil is really effective, see, if the coil is very powerful, what should be the exit temperature? So please tell me, the coil temperature is of TS. So let's say if it's a very powerful cooling coil. So a bit slow, take 10 minutes extra, please be slow. Okay, fine, I'll be slow. What I'm talking? Bypass factor, okay, see. So yeah, so let's see if this coil is highly powerful, then if this is T1 at this point, if this is T1 at this point, and if this is T2 at this point, if the coil is very powerful coil, what should be T2 actually? What should be T2 actually? What should be T2? Let's say if this coil is very powerful coil. It should be TS, correct? Yes or no? Because whatever the air that comes here, this coil will definitely cool that air to TS. Yes or no? Yes, it should be TS. But practically it won't be TS because some part of the air will not get in contact with this coil. It will escape. It will bypass this coil. Actually your job is to cool, but some air will not get in touch with this coil and it will get bypassed. Okay, so what is the fraction that's getting bypassed is called the bypass factor. And if you understand this, this by fa bypass factor X is actually heat or, you know, loss in cooling loss in cooling divided by maximum possible cooling maximum possible cooling see this ratio is like if the coil is highly powerful there is nothing no loss in the cooling effect completely it gets cooled okay so then there were if it is getting completely cooled that means there is no bypass factor for uh, you know there is no much uh, amount of air which is getting bypassed by the cooling coil okay so therefore this is the loss in cooling coil and this is the maximum possible cooling that we have and clearly this x is written as h2 minus hs by maximum it can cool is h1 minus hs actually here okay so h2 minus hs divided by h1 minus hs actually so this is the expression what you wrote s minus 2 by s minus 1 ha okay maybe if you flip these two then s minus 2 by s minus 1 but normally we'll generally it as h2 minus hs divided by h1 minus hs because generally h2 is more than hs and h1 is also more than hs actually now since majority of the substance is air sometimes we also write this if you write it as cp times t2 minus t1 in that sort we'll write t2 minus ts by t1 minus ts actually so that's how you have the bypass factor in this case of air conditioning sensible cooling okay so clear is it clear to all of you fine okay so this is the cooling coil so this is basically the loss in the cooling effect per unit mass of uh, you know airflow okay and this is the maximum possible cooling that can happen but the ratio of these two is nothing but your bypass factor okay because people feel again some difficulty in mugging up these numbers 2s12 all this 2s1s all these things so again that's uh, need not be there okay 
so cooling bypass factor uh, guys actually uh, it's already 6 1 fine uh, we'll do one thing I mean on all your you know acceptance can we continue it uh, from tomorrow because I have still two three more process which I should uh, cover at this depth normally dehumidification and also humidification is also a bit important and after that adiabatic mixing of two moisture streams okay let's see if two moist streams of air is mixing what could be the end conditions okay so calculating this stuff is important some questions came on that as well so we'll because rather than rushing in hurry in next 10 15 minutes i definitely know it takes next 25 30 more minutes because i again have class from seven o'clock to ten o'clock uh, one of the batches okay so we will stop it here as of now okay so i'll do one thing regarding compressors and this uh, turbines i'll upload the notes on pressure compounding and velocity compounding this stuff so tomorrow after finishing of this air conditioning we will uh, start looking at uh, you know this compressible flows okay because compressible flows is a bit important every year one two questions are definitely coming on them so let's see okay yeah fine so i'm closing this lecture here as of now guys you have some homework questions this you can solve now homework homework okay and you can also solve Actually, whatever I have taught you, with that you can solve this homework, four questions. So please try these four questions, one, two, three, and four questions. But please try these questions, okay? So don't, uh, you know, stop. Please uh, try these four questions before you come for tomorrow's class. So in today's class, what are the stuff we have covered? Uh, we talked about uh, moist air, yeah. We talked about moist air. Then we talked about basic properties. Basic properties, like phi, omega, dry bulb temperature, wet bulb, depression, all this stuff we have talked about. And then we started looking at chart, adiabatic saturation temperature, T, adiabatic saturation, adiabatic saturation, which is one very important technique for calculating omega and phi. Okay. And uh, we then talked about psychometric chart, psychometric chart. Of course, if it's, has a, if it's a detailed course, I would have talked about some 30 to 35 minutes on this particular psychometric chart because how constant volume lines are inclined. Normally, if you see, this constant enthalpy lines and constant volume lines, they lie almost parallel, okay? So, but volume is much more inclined. But why it's happening and all, I might have talked in detail of all these things. But right now, uh, you know, just uh, as of now, because it's a fast track, just I'm, I've given you a chart, psychometric chart and uh, psychometric process a bit. psychometric processes clear so psychometric process these are the things that we have covered actually in today's class okay thank you sir uh, thank you for improving questions uh, questions theoretical questions this time telegram pe send ka diya ha yeah I, i'll send that uh, uh, questions uh, i mean sorry this knowledge of compressors and turbines okay yeah so we will stop here at this point and this is the telegram id if you want to join this Okay, so we officially close this lecture. So tomorrow we'll start, we'll continue this psychometric process to some extent and we will start compressible flows. Okay, are you all understanding the things, what I'm talking? Okay, are you all understanding all the theoretical concepts? Then of course, problems and all, bit of maths, uh, that's it, okay? Some bit of equations that we should know. How important is it for gate exams, sir? Compass, compasses and turbines? Normally, actually, your questions, compasses and turbines, are rank and cycle, baton cycles, but cover like in extra concepts say, like uh, compounding in case of turbines okay volumetric efficiency in case of compressors these uh, things are there i have taught it in one of the i mean in every batch i have taken in detailed course but uh, you know right now i'll try to upload the notes for that compressors and turbines but in uh, you know telegram group okay fine okay so conceptual understanding has to be there then you have to apply that concept in sort of in some set of equations so you should put in some math some divisions, equations, vectors, and all if needed, like in fluid mechanics we have done, and we should solve them. That's it. So theoretical questions solving ko kai se improve kare. Just go through all the concepts what we are telling. Okay. So story mene apko pada tha. Us story pe thoda sa dhyan se suniye. Bas, you will get it. You can solve PVQs and any other new questions. Majority of you who are following my class since day one. I'm sure majority of you are at least so able to solve all theoretical questions. But this time, no lottery, just logic and things. FMB is very tough, laga hai, sir. It's a mathematical thought, sir. It's not. Fine. Yeah. Okay, then. Uh, we'll close this lecture. 
So tomorrow we'll continue this uh, psychometric process to whatever I have covered, whatever it's done. So we'll cover this psychometric process again. We'll see dehumidification, what is the mass of water vapor condensing, all this uh, bit of math we'll see again. And uh, then adiabatic mixing we'll see. I think that could be helpful for psychometric air conditioning. Then we will start combustible flows. Okay, in some you'll in combustible flows you'll understand certain important uh, you know fluid mechanics and thermodynamics combinations. Again, that's helpful to you. Okay, fine. So thank you all. We'll meet tomorrow again at 4 p.m. Okay, so bye. Yeah, bye.